Hey, welcome to Comic Library, everybody. It's Brad's friend Dave, and boy, do we have exciting news for you this week, especially in light of the fact that Twitter is melting down in real time. Bradley J., <laughs> what is the big news for this week? Oh, well, we've got a great new sponsor that we are welcoming to the show, DreamHost. Now, you've heard me talk about DreamHost in the past. I've used them personally for years and years and years. I went back to try to find out when I started using them. I don't even know when I started. I've just been doing it forever, and there's a reason that I've been using using DreamHost forever. They're really that good. And as we're looking at uh, social media shifting in a big way, we said this last episode, you really want to make sure that you've got your own website. That's we, we've, yes. we've elevated that, right, Dave? It used to be a yep. suggestion. Oh, yeah. Now it's a, you need to get on this. It's a must have. Honestly, this is the space online that you own and control. It's where you set up your base of operations and where you're pointing everything in your life in any social media sphere is back to that website. And that's why this is so key right now. Absolutely. So here's what I want you to do. Go to dreamhost.com slash comic lab, and you're going to see that they've got two systems all set up for you. They're ready to go. They're ready to welcome you into the crowd. Okay. They've got the shared <laughs> starter system and the shared unlimited system now uh, you, you can go in and see all the stuff that you get there i'm just going to give you the broad overview but here's what i want you to hear shared starter system starts at two dollars and 59 cents a month that's that is nothing you know how, when people say that's less than a cup of coffee uh, that that's getting to be like less than a candy bar you know that that's that's <laughs> cheap and the shared unlimited system is three dollars and 95 cents a month that you get all kinds of stuff including a website free domain unlimited traffic wordpress pre-installed dave do you remember when you had to install oh, when WordPress? you had to do it yourself oh no oh, no yeah, yeah they've got it all i still set. have i still have ptsd from those days but not here yeah. not in this way yeah i cannot endorse dream host strongly enough there's a reason i've been with them for so long you know me i'm a grump somebody somebody screws up somebody something goes wrong i'm i'm barreling out the door I've, 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 I, it's never come up. It's never come up with dream host. They've even made they have this... fixed your problems for yes. you. In fact, they have fixed problems for every you. now and again. When I screw things up, I put a support ticket in next thing. You know, I'm getting something back from them. And, and, oh, by the way, it's not like a chat bot. You can tell you're talking to a real live human being. And a few times they've said, Hey, while I was figuring out this problem that you did yourself, Brad, uh, I, I saw something else in there. He said, give me permission. I'll go ahead and fix it. Next thing you know, my website is running better than ever. That's what you're dealing with, with dream host. That's why we're so happy. That's why we can, uh, wholeheartedly endorse these folks. Uh, they're, they're really the best. So I want you to go over to dreamhost.com slash comic lab, take a look at what they've got on offer over there and start thinking about setting your own website up as Twitter continues to melt down. This is a move that you need to make. Amen. Now let's hit the music. Can I admit a little bit of cartoony snobbery to you uh, oh, this I, week? You came to the right place. If you've got <laughs> something bad to say, sit next to me. <laughs> so I'm at a restaurant with the family, and they, there's some children's menus that are distributed, right? And children's menus at any restaurant that had them, it's always the two-sided paper, and it says, you know, <laughs> pancakes, super small size, $50, yeah. you know, whatever it is. But they always have the map and the little, you yeah. know, help, help Mr. Pancake find Mr. Syrup and get him through the maze. <laughs> and then on the back, is a drawing, but I don't know what it is about my cartooning snobbery. This is not a one-time occasion. This has happened on multiple occasions at multiple restaurants. Yeah. I, I always want to stand up and go talk to the manager and be like, I will redraw this for you. This is a terrible bit of cartooning. This does not look like Mr. Pancake. Mr. Syrup looks more like he's been hit on the head. Is he drunk? I'm not sure what's happening. You can always tell that the restaurant like hired a nephew that thinks that they're a cartoonist and it's like the worst menu drawings. Am I alone in this? Am I the only one that's ever felt this way, Brad? I just, oh, by the way, first of all, no, you are not alone. Secondly, I love the thought that somewhere in, in Los Angeles, there's a restaurant where a waitress is coming up saying, uh, Mr. Finster, uh, yeah, uh, we 
we've got a customer that wants to have a word with you. And he says, oh, what, were, were the waffles cold? No, no, that, no, the waffles were fine. Was was the syrup not heated to a, it? No, no, <laughs> syrup was great. Syrup was good. The forks, forks were clean. They the water. Love, love was, the food, love the food. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, uh, he wants to, yeah, but he still wants to have a word with you. Well, okay, bring him up here. Ah, yes, uh, my name is Mr. Finster, uh, and, and, and your name is? David Kellett, yes, hi. And, like and, to... and do you have a problem? Is there, uh, sir, is there a situation? Sir, I'd like to lodge in the strongest possible complaint. The line art, the line art quality on this is unvarying. It looks like it was drawn by a Sharpie. The photocopying was done unsuccessfully at Kinko's. It looks like it was mimeographed. They actually went back in time to a, to a shoddier still way of, of uh, copying it. Sir, the, the hand lettering on this map, I can barely yeah. read Mr. Pancake or and, Mr. Syrup. And, and by the way, why does Mr. Pancake want to find Mr. Syrup? I would leave Mr. Syrup on the other end of that mage because I'm just going to get eaten after the syrup hits me. He wants to all the quicker embrace the sweet embrace of death, Brad. That's what he wants. <laughs> Do we really want to be knows, telling our children this? He knows how he's been drawn. He wants to end this quickly. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc., and I'm his friend Dave Kellett, the new cartoonist of Mama Cassoni's Pancake Emporium. <laughs> and I'm also the cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and the co-director of Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is brought to you by our good friends at Patreon. Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. So Dave, Dave! Let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. And a reminder that this show is going out live to our Patreon pals over at patreon.com slash comic lab. Uh, the Live Gap group joins us every week for the live stream, and there is a concurrent chat going along, and we answer questions and chit chat before, during, and after the show. So do join us over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And Brad, a quick question. Why did yeah. I call it Mama Cassoni's Pancake Emporium? That sounds like uh, they're about to serve me pasta and not pancakes. I don't yeah, know what's going on. It sounds like you're going to get spaghetti pancakes. I'm not sure. <laughs> Or marinara sauce on I your waffles. Like, has, has Dave Kellett never been to a pancake house before? Is that what the lie has been revealed? I, I don't know what, what that but was. I gotta, I gotta tell you, you're not, it, it's just so you don't feel bad. You're not alone in that. I have looked at that and it, it's always the worst art, the most uncreative mazes. And I'm like, you know, I, I, I would do it better for free just just so they'd have something good to hand to these kids. I think if for me it's about the kids, these poor kids waiting <laughs> for their waffles. They've got the worst fucking the, the find a word. They're always it's they're just in 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 a line one, two, three, four. You don't have to work to find them. They're sitting right there. It's always the worst. Yeah, when the first letter on the first line is is F and it just reads fork, it's like you're not really trying on this on this word hide. It's really not that hard. Uh but uh a, a quick follow-up. Why did for you was the restaurant manager named Uncle Finster? Wasn't that from the uh, Adams family? Isn't that? Yeah, uh... I was. I was literally going through as you were talking. Uh, instead of listening to what you were saying, I was going through names, and I went through about <laughs> ten of them, uh, and then I got to Finster when I ran out of time, and then that's what I blurted <laughs> and then out. That's what. That's what you doubled out, and that's why comedy. You just got to commit. You just commit to the bit, and yeah. uh, and no matter what you. That's why we're now we're now currently at Mama Cassoni's uh, Pancake <laughs> Emporium, where it's managed by Uncle Finster of the Munsters. So there we go, everybody. That's right. That's um, right. Not the Munsters. My God, David, the Adams family. Anyway. All right. So, Brad, I'm going to lead us off with a topic not coming in from a reader, but coming in from my heart. Uh, and that is about the social contract that a cartoonist has when they start a story or yeah. a series. Um, and I wanted to ask you, because I've been thinking about this, when an artist starts a series or they start a story that's long form um, and they know they're committing to a long commitment time wise yeah. and work wise. Yeah. Do after after a certain amount of time, do they owe their audience a finish? And uh, now I know you're immediately going to think of George R. R. Martin with uh, the song yeah. Always and Fire and stuff. So let's for the most part, we can skip that. I'm talking about just for artists. Yeah. Uh, is there a sliding scale of what they owe? And is it fair of audiences or of patrons to demand a finish? I. Uh well, no. I, I, so here's the deal. Uh, of course, you out of out of nothing more than creative pride, you'd want to uh, finish what you started for yourself. 
But I think we put so much pressure on ourselves as creators, uh, particularly when I'm looking at some of the younger people that are uh, posting on Webtoons right now and the pressure they put on themselves and the pressure that they report feeling from the Webtoons platform. Uh, it, it, I, I, I don't think that's conducive to a very healthy, creative uh, atmosphere. So uh, so it, my answer is, is there, d does an artist, does a cartoonist uh, owe a reader an end to the story? I'd say no, they don't owe them anywhere, anything in that social contract you're talking about. Uh, but does a... Uh, does a comics artist owe an end to a backer? Perhaps. In fact, I would probably lean towards yes. In other words, owe the reader? No. Owe the backer? Yes. You do. Now, once you get to the point where you've got people that are invested in you, mm -hmm. literally and, and figuratively, then there's a bigger impetus on you to honor that arrangement. And for the for the for the reason being this, you use the word social contract, and that's an important word there. Contracts go two ways, okay? <laughs> There's two ways for that contract to go, uh, and you're for a reader. That's a one way street, right? Right. You're putting it to the reader. That's going one way. They're they're not reciprocating anything back necessarily. OK, right. but once that reader becomes a Patreon backer or a Kickstarter backer, then you're entering into a situation where there are some things that I think you'd want to take more seriously. And uh, finding a good ending for your story is one of those things. So uh, it, because that contract goes two ways, that's a that's a two way street. And now you're you're entering into a little bit higher level of responsibility. So does a social contract exist between an artist and a reader? Not necessarily. Does it exist between a, a artist and a Patreon backer or any other social media or any other crowdfunding backer, I'd say maybe I'd lean towards yes. Okay. Well, before we explore my opinion, I, I very much would like to explore your opinion because I think there's interest here. So in your world, and I uh, let's just take that I, I accept it. <laughs> in my no, world. <laughs> in, in a world in, in where your, Brad what, is the, what color is the sky in your world, <laughs> yeah. Brad? Hey, Brad. So in this nonsense bullshit world you've created for yourself. No, I'm being serious here. So uh, in, in your line of thinking, which I'm yeah. honoring for this moment, uh, because I don't necessarily disagree with it, but in, in this world that, we are, that you're describing here, it is there a sliding scale of like Brad Geiger is mentally unhappy finishing the story? It is actively yeah. negatively impacting your life. Or do you, if there's only one backer, do you owe them a finish? Or is there a hundred backers and you owe them a finish? A thousand backers. Oh, that's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah. I think that the more backers you get, the more seriously you've got to take that commitment. So yeah, if if because I if I'm being completely honest, if I've only got one backer, it's a lot easier for me to in fact if I've You're got like, one. Well, mom, I, I'm not finishing it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can just I can just write that person a note and say, listen, I I, I need to personally apologize to you, my one backer, but this story isn't going to have a finish. It's making me miserable. Right. Uh, uh, but, but the more backers you get, yeah, I, I've got, I, I've got a cop to that a hundred percent. The more backers you get, the more seriously you've got to take that commitment because it means that you've touched a lot of people and, and the more people that you reach, I think, uh, if I'm being totally honest, the more people you reach, the more you have to honor seeing through what you started. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it really does have to do with uh, uh, with not only uh, quality, but quantity. It, it's 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 the bigger audience, the more you've got to take it serious. So, Brad, a utilitarian approach to cartooning with the size of the audience does matter. Now, listen, I don't necessarily disagree with you again. I, I in this world that you're constructing, uh, yeah. I, I, I do see your point. I think if we can turn it for a second to, to the way I look at this. I think two or three things can be true at the same time. Yeah. And they they have they're kind of competing against one another. I think first and foremost, your own mental and creative health is is the primary mover, motivator, uh, justification for a lot of actions, right? And so sure, let's jump back on George R. R. Martin for a second. 
I think if he is not ready to finish those books, that's the first and foremost uh, consideration, right? The artist comes first in their own, in their own mental health, in their emotional health, in their creative health. Um, and so for me, if I'm not ready to finish a story, that comes first. But I do agree with you that there is a, a debt owed both. Mm -hmm. I would extend it a little bit further than you. I think both the, implica the implied promise to an, an audience, even if they're just readers, not paying readers, that there is going to be a finish just on a human level that if I start a joke at a party, I've got to finish the joke. I can't just walk away and be like, oh, those crudités look lovely. I'm going to go try. I'm going to try a carrot, you know? Uh, and by the way, yes, I just did use the word crudite. What a fancy little doofus. Um, anyway, well, I can, here I can, in Philadelphia, we call that a veggie tray. I can run. I can run for Senate in Pennsylvania now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered that story. Um, so uh, anyway, um, what was I going to say? Oh, anyway, so yeah, so I do feel like there, but three things can be true at once yeah. i think there is a debt owed to myself a debt owed to generalized reader and a debt owed to paying patrons but they have different weights and i would say that the debt owed to yourself is the most important because it's like an airplane when the when the mass drop you got to take care of yourself first and then you take care of the kid next to you <laughs> you know what i mean because uh, yeah. if you if you have a, 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 a mental moment or an emotional breakdown or a creative breakdown no one is served so you've got to serve yourself first right um, and so that that you have to uh, put the artist in service first. And then I think the the needs and interests and concerns of the paying patrons second and then the broader audience third. But I think yeah. all three of those can be true at the same time or in a, on a sliding scale. Yeah, I, I, I got to tell you, I, and maybe this is just revealing my own, uh, you know, inner thoughts here, maybe too much. <laughs> <laughs> but the the so we all know the experience of having a reader saying, "I'd buy that on a T-shirt." And of course, I think it's one of the comic commandments is is, is that the first reader to say, "I'll buy that on a on a T-shirt," is the first person to disappear when you put the T-shirt out. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. The yeah. minute that a reader honors their part of the contract. I'll honor my part, but I know that <laughs> readers are not, uh, that they're, they're readers. They're passive. They're passive. Uh, that is something that is not as important to me when I'm deciding uh, my decisions on creativity and all, and, and this sort of thing, knowing full well that this reader is the first person to disappear when, uh, when I, uh, when I respond to their direct needs makes it less important for me to worry about what they think. And again, a Patreon backer, that's a completely different thing. That's somebody that is that has become invested in what you're doing that you've got to take more seriously. But that that reader that you're talking about, first person to disappear when I put a T-shirt out, I'm not worried about disappointing them in the slightest. Well, let me ask you if this if this uh, colors the conversation. So we've talked in the past about how currently audiences have a smorgasbord of options when it comes to entertainment, right? It's yeah. like, it's almost like the, the sushi restaurant conveyor belt of, right. of content, right. right? If there's nothing on Disney, you go to Hulu. If there's nothing on Hulu, you go to Barnes and Noble. If there's nothing at Barnes and Noble, you go to, you go to the internet. If there's nothing on the internet, you go to Reddit, if, you know, whatever it is, there's a nonstop of smorgasbord of, of content sliding by you. And so the thing that I'm creating is the most important thing to me as an artist. God, am I right. invested in Drive, for example? Oh, right. I, I'm gonna. I love that story. I'm gonna finish that story. If I drop dead tomorrow, yeah. it's one less thing on the smorgasbord of of conveyor belt content that the rest of the world is getting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I do feel like there is. That's why I put more of the onus on the health and safety and and well being of the artist than on the expectations of the audience because it's all these people that are stalking an artist to have them finish the book or or you know uh, going after the playwright or musician to finish the album or the play that they never yeah. finished that's such bullshit because it's just one more thing to that reader in the right. smorgasbord of content in the world but i think to, to the artist it's far more central and important what i'm getting at here is that uh, I do think that plays into it in the fact that it's just one item among 10,000 bits of content that you'll see today, never mind this week, you know? Right. Yeah. And it, and it very well, it's it, to your, uh, to your point, uh, a lot of people might not even notice that you disappeared until right. maybe, right. you know, months or weeks or years later when they say, oh yeah, whatever happened to that thing that I was watching. Yeah. And so I, however, having said all that though, I do feel on the day to day or week to week thing of creating drive, I personally 
feel an onus to finish the story. Yeah. And and that is different, I think, than a social contract. And I liked the phrase you used earlier. You said something like creative pride or something. Yeah, or, or or creative self-respect. Yeah. Just out of out of your own self-respect uh, as an artist, you want to complete that thing. Yeah. And I think it's also a lesson that we've learned again and again in our career, which is um uh, finish something, you know? And yes. so we, we always tell people when you're starting your, just do a short story so that you have finished a thing. You know, you yeah. can start a thing, you can do the middle of the thing and you can finish a thing. I very much want to tell myself that I can finish a story that took me 12 to 15 years to tell. That yeah. to me on my deathbed will feel like, boy, there's a lot of talk about me dying today. That on my deathbed <laughs> will feel like it was, it was a pretty good accomplishment creatively, you know, that yeah. I had a finished story to offer and leave the world. Um, do you ever think about that with with Evil Link? Like, what to you will be the finished Evil Link? Yeah, I, as you were talking, I was kind of thinking about that because Evil Link started out as a comic strip, and I started it with a comic strip mentality, meaning right. I want this to go on forever because that's what we were presented as uh, a, a, what a professional uh, uh, career was like Schultz, is yeah, that you yeah. you started this thing and it went on forever. Even perhaps after your death, another team would come in and take over and keep doing this thing. Right. Uh, and so uh, everything about Evil Inc. was built with the idea of making stories that continued, went on uh, uh, forever and ever and ever and just kept building and building and building. And then in 2014, when I retooled and and kind of rethought, uh, realized obviously that newspaper comics were never coming back. Right. You know that was and and newspaper comics, although they were good in an ad based uh, internet, were not great uh, in a social media dominated internet. And I had right. to rethink. Then I had to rethink of Evil Link as a story uh, that had uh, some some sort of a beginning and end. And uh, my, uh, I've got a completely different, I've got no problem ending the story. I know basically that the story is probably going to end right around the time that uh, the main conflict in the center of the storytelling, uh, Captain Her Heroic and Mismatch. Well, don't reveal one, the ending. <laughs> no, well, I'm no, I, I don't think it's stealing to say that once they finally get back together, it it kind of brings everything to a close, right. at oh, least okay. for that part of the universe. Right. Uh, I, and, because then I, it, 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 there's a little bit more to tell in terms of like them being a, a, a couple. Mm -hmm. But once they get to a point where they're married and perhaps having kids, that's kind of where the Evil Inc. newspaper strip started. And then right. it's like, well, we're full circle now. And yeah. then I have to make some hard decisions about what I want to do next. And that's the scary part for me is I, I don't have a problem with ending it, but I'm terrified to because I haven't quite gotten my head around what would come next. And that's the yeah. part that's scary, you know? Interesting. Do you think the, this is a separate question. Do you think the lack of knowing what comes next will keep future Brad from wrapping up in a, oh. in a successful, clean way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, listen, for the first couple of years under the rewrite, under the new uh, reboot, uh, I, I, a lot of my storytelling was not so great because of that. And now I'm literally forcing myself to take the next step and to take the next step and to take the next step because it's because also what happens is if I keep teasing this relationship and then breaking it and teasing it and breaking it, you can only do that so long before it becomes annoying. Yeah. Right? It, it becomes yeah. a pattern. Uh, something I was, I, I was talking about in my class just yesterday is that it, our readers are trained to notice patterns. And as soon as they catch us in a pattern, our storytelling becomes dull. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and I've done this a couple swings now where I tease the relationship and it's like I've, I, I'm forcing myself now <laughs> to keep going in forward steps because otherwise I know my storytelling is going to stink. And so I'm, I'm I, I am literally David dragging myself all oh, along. I now I understand. Screaming. I understand the hesitation because now if you advance the relationship, 
it's admitting to yourself that the ending is coming. Is that what I'm saying? One step closer to the yeah. end. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. I don't okay. know what happens. That I mean, I, it, oh, what a what a wonderful uh, parallel to life itself. Every every step I take brings me one step closer to death. And the reason we fear death is that we really don't know what comes next. And that's what's happening yeah. creatively. And yet I am dragging myself, <laughs> kicking and screaming towards the end, because if I don't, it's not a good life. It's it's I it, it becomes boring and dull. So yeah. you got to keep going. And yeah. and that's that's literally where I find myself as I sit down to write the next page uh, later on uh, this week is is taking another step towards the inevitable. Well, let me, I, I will unsolicited share a bit of advice that's been helpful to me, and maybe it will be helpful to you in this larger picture of fulfilling an implied or explicit or expected social contract of finishing a story. Mm -hmm. I, by hook or by crook, not by intention, have come up with a follow-up story for Drive that I could tell once this story wraps up. And for whatever reason, psychologically, it's helping me finish this story because I yeah. don't have this weight of I'll never get to play in this universe sandbox again once I finish right. the story, you know, because and, and frankly, between you, me and the wall, it's probably a lie. I don't know that I'll do that second story because I don't know that I want to start another 10 years with drive. I probably want to start another story, you know. Yeah. And, but. For the time being, the lie that I'm telling myself is helping me fulfill the little social contract of finishing drive because mm -hmm. it's giving me the implication that I don't have to leave. It's not a true death, Brad. It's, it's right. just it's just a temporary going to sleep and then I'll it's wake just, back up again. You're just, yeah. you're just being sent out to a farm where you yeah. can frolic and it's chase the It's a lovely farm ducks. upstate in New York and I get yeah. to run with the other dogs and it's going to be great. <laughs> I will tell you this. I will tell you this. And you can see it playing out uh, right now if you go and and read my stuff that's being posted as we speak. Uh, one of the things that I kind of experimented in my mind is like, okay, when this comes to an end, I purposefully made a branch of evil ink instead of this being a monolithic corporation. I, 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 I broke it into branches. And so when this ends, I could just go to another branch and start a new story with a whole new cast of characters. Oh, and, that's and do, fun. The same, stay in the same universe and still even bring characters over as I need them or as I want to. And what I did this uh, in this chapter is I sent Mismatch to the Akron, Ohio branch of <laughs> Evil Inc. <laughs> Right. I always, I always think about that from a storytelling perspective of how useless Spider-Man would be in Akron, Ohio. You yeah. know, yeah. like what the hell would he get done? He couldn't swing. He couldn't do it. He'd be like yeah. running down the street in Akron. Like, Here I come. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Look, looking for a telephone pole or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sweet. yeah. But, uh, but they're, they're in, and, and by the way, I've got it so that the only place for them to have an office in Akron, Ohio is in a mall. So they're like right between, <laughs> you know, two different malt, like they're between Orange Julius and, and uh, I, I'm this close to putting Chess King in there just for, uh, just for a ridiculous reference. Spirit Halloween. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. But they're in a mall and, and that's where the office is. Uh, so, and, and the cast that I made there was kind of like, okay, what was, what if I was redoing a cast right now? Uh, and, and I unleashed a lot more creativity a right. lot more right. looseness a lot more confidence as a creator in that cast uh and so it, it, a little bit what i'm doing with this chapter is reassuring myself that you know i can end this and start something else and and i mean what what what, what does it come down to dave if this were somebody writing us a question I'd be the first person telling that person, listen, you end that story when you when it's it's right to end it. You write a good story. You're a creator, so you're going to create. And when it comes time to create a new story, you're going to create that new story. You need to have confidence in yourself. That's what I would tell anybody else. And that's exactly the advice that I need to talk to myself about. Right, you know, I right. got to take my own advice when it comes to that. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that both you and I have written ourselves because I've somewhat subtly written it into drive this sort of backup story. And you've yeah. subtly written it into the backup of evil Inc that you have your version of the West coast Avengers now, yep. but they're in Akron, Ohio, which is yep. you sort of have the great Lake Avengers, which is what this fun. Uh, 
but and I have this other storyline that you can see on the map of Drive. You, if you sort of intuit what it's going to be, that's the backup story, mm-hmm. uh, and that's our way of protecting our sweet baby hearts so that yes. we can bring this to we can land the plane and bring this to a finish yeah uh but let me ask you one last question on this and then we'll, we'll wrap it up mm-hmm. is it right for a reader to expect a social contract that the story will end uh, <laughs> yes and it's right for me to accept then i buy a t-shirt but neither one of those things are necessarily going to happen Ooh, zingo yikes <laughs> <laughs> no, come on, come on. Let's, let's be realistic. They can, they can expect all they want, but <laughs> until they, until they make the switch from being passive to active, they can't realistically expect anything. And yeah. also as, because I've been doing this for as long as I have, realistically, I can't expect them to buy that t-shirt. We right. both have to be realists. They right. have to be a realist to know that if they're not actively supporting this thing that I'm doing, they can't have uh, 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 unrealistic expectations. I've got to be a realist and I've got to say if I, 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 the same thing. I can't just expect them to say, well, I, I made a comment on social media. Now I got to buy a t-shirt. I can't expect that either. So we both have to be realists. I love this, the realistic expectations. This is what it sounded like from you. Yeah, we all know what this is. You're going to try reading my comic. I'm going to try finishing the story. We all know this could all end in flames. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's that's not that's not untrue. I mean, that that that's that's the situation I, I mean, I we all get maybe into. Maybe that's true in the sense that you're asking them to hold hands and we're going to jump together. Yeah. And hopefully we'll have a happy landing. Mm-hmm. But there are, I guess there are no promises in life. And that's no. basically where we're coming down to is that I'm going to try my best. Here, and, and here's the other thing. And this is something I don't think we've ever talked about on the show, but it's one of the immutable laws of web comics. And that is if you don't support a thing that you love, it will disappear. That is we've very seen true. That. How many times have we seen that in web comics for, for, or, or in independent comics uh, in, in general? Where, you know, it, it, something is, is, is loved, regarded, but for one reason or another, and there's a, a plethora of reasons yep. that that support, that financial support mm-hmm. uh, never lands. And then at some point that thing disappears and then those passive readers say, oh man, I really missed that comic. I enjoyed reading it. Well, if you don't support it, it will disappear. That's a, again, being a realist at some point, that thing, uh, if it's not being, uh, if it's not rewarding, not only creatively, but financially and everything else, that creator is going to make a choice that they have to make a realistic choice and say, I'm going to go do something else for a while. Yeah. So it's, 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 it, it, it's, it always sounds snotty. It sounds mean, but if you don't right now, if, if there's somebody that's listening to the show that, uh, and they love a comic, one particular comic, not mine, not yours, any comic out any there, comic, yeah. and they're not supporting that comic, they cannot be upset if it disappears. If you don't support it, it will disappear. Yeah. No, and I think that's a that's a great time, Brad, just to mention uh, patreon.com slash comic club. Yeah. <laughs> hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. (laughs) All right, Brad, well, quick update for everybody this week. This is coming in from a YouTube member, Bono. He's apologizing again for convincing Apple to automatically add YouTube's 2014 album to everyone's iTunes account oh, years ago. Oh. This is a quote from Bono. And listen to see if this sounds familiar to you, uh, comics artists. 
quote, I thought if we could just put our music within reach of people, they might choose to reach out towards it. Not quite, unquote. The year is 2022, and he's still apologizing almost 10 years after the fact yeah. for um, this this thing that he did. And if it sounds familiar, it's it, there's two takeaways on this uh, that I really want you to, to think about. The first one should make you feel a little bit better. If you've ever thought, if I could just get my comic in front of more people, they would like it and I could find success more easily. Mm -hmm. I could get to the next step. Mm -hmm. If I could just get, that's a nigh universal feeling. Yep. Even Bono, a world recognized uh, celebrity rock star, right? One of the biggest names from the eighties and nineties, even Bono. Uh, it, it has that same exact feeling. Yep. It's 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 universal. If only I could get my stuff in front of more people. Right. Uh, and and here's the second part. It almost always is a failed concept. It just doesn't work. It takes more than just getting your stuff in front of people. I realize that this was unique a little bit in that it was kind of forced on us. It was it was not an opt in. It was it was something that just showed up and we did not like it, but it was failed. And I'll tell you why it was failed opt in or opt out. It was failed because if it had succeeded. Right, so stop. Stop just for a second. Think about my magic wand theory that I shared with you on the show a few times, right? If I could wave a magic wand and get your comic in front of a million people mm -hmm, today, mm -hmm. would you take that deal? Yes, I and would. What I've told you <laughs> yes, I would. before, no matter who you <laughs> are, you would before. take that deal. It's a bum deal. Yeah. Don't take it. This is proof that the of, of the magic wand theory yeah. that you should not take that deal because Bono waved his magic wand. Okay. And if it would have worked, he would not be apologizing for it still eight years later. If it would have worked, it would have been a, a gambit that paid off. If it would have worked, he would have said, I was the smartest guy in the world. Maybe you should have thought of that. Right. If it would have worked, he'd be uh, proud of it. Instead, it didn't work. And eight years later, he's still apologizing for and it. And then I can, I, I like Brad said, I can hear those of you out there saying, yeah, but they the problem was that you two forced it on people yeah. and they didn't ask for this. Well, then to that, I would turn to everyone who we try to advise not to buy advertising for your comic. You are forcing <laughs> your comic in front of people. Yes. It does yeah. not work. The best growth is organic growth. Unfortunately, the best growth is slow and steady growth where audience members are continuously seeing it two or three or four times in their feed or on Reddit or in a past among their friends or socially, you know, a uh, uh, shared those. Unfortunately, that's the growth that stays. It's just the honest truth. Yes. It's not a happy thought, but it's the growth that stays. Now, sometimes is there explosive uh, 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 growth within that sort of organic growth? Yes, of course. And of course, yep. any one of us, myself included, would love to get it in front of a million people right now. That is a right. truth universal. And, and we will always yes. want that. But yes. I think what Brad is saying is it is not the panacea that you think it is towards right. growing your audience. And, and, and go back. If, if you're still over there stomping your feet and saying, but no, you guys are missing it. You're not understanding. It was forced and that's why it was bad. OK, let's say you're right. What's the uh, but but if 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 forcing somebody to look at your comic is bad, what's the alternative? Earning their views. And that comes down to doing a good comic. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to force them and we both agree, it's not a good idea to, to, to all of a sudden uh, have your version of YouTube uh, or I'm sorry, you two uh, showing up in their iTunes uh, the opposite of that is earning the views day after day after grinding day by doing the best comic you co you possibly can. That's those are the two choices, <laughs> and we both agree. Uh, doing a unilateral push was not a good idea. So now you're left with the uh, alternative: doing the best that you can possibly do today, and then setting out to do it again tomorrow, and to slowly raise that bar on yourself, mm -hmm. hold yourself to a higher standard, be honest with yourself, hold your feet to the fire, and then do it all over again and again and again. That's 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 how you build a career. Absolutely. Well, Brad, let's do one final update for today, and this is uh, has to do with France. Uh, I, when we were talking about sh the Schultz Museum the other day. It occurred to me, and there's no, 
there's no uh, justifiable reason for this. It's just I just think it would be fun. I have yeah. a new five year goal for you and I and for Comic Lab. And it's an impossible goal because it will never happen. But I just want it to happen because it would be fun. Yeah. I want you and I and Comic Lab, more specifically Comic Lab, to be invited as guests of show to Angoulême in Angoulême, France. Now, for those that don't know, Ooh. that's the big European show. It's uh, about 150,000 people, I think. I'd, I'd have to pull up Wikipedia, but it's about 150,000 people. It's an outdoors yeah. uh, show in the medieval walled town of Angoulême, France. It's fantastic. It's kind of in winter, so sometimes it's snowy, sometimes it's rainy, but it's always fun because you get a way more international audience uh, at least by American standards, than you do at Comic-Con. Uh, uh, a, a big chunk of France and a whole bunch of Europe comes to the show. You'll get Chinese, Korean artists that come, Japanese artists that come. Anyway, I don't, it will never happen. I, there's no reason yeah. for the French to be like, hey, these two American artists that talk about capitalism a lot. Yeah, that's who we want. <laughs> we, we French artists absolutely love talking about making a career with capitalism. That's what we want to talk about. I mean, do you remember, Brad, when we went to the NCS? <laughs> panel talk yes. and there was a bunch of French artists on the panel and they were talking about yeah. how they made the career and some I think I brought up Kickstarter and I brought up like how yeah. you could do it with Patreon and how you got to reach out to your audience and own and control your own business and I I could almost see them th getting ready to throw the baguette at me because it was like n yes. they did not want to talk about how to make a career or a, or a financial decision in your career they wanted to <laughs> hand it all over to the publisher and never have to sully their hands Yes. With capitalism. And you and I were so taken aback about the cultural difference there between French and American artists. Yeah. The only time they showed greater disdain is when somebody intimated that cartoonists didn't date a lot well, when they I was were the one that, uh, yeah. young. I implied that as a high schooler, I didn't date much because I was a cartoonist. And they got so mad about that. Yeah. They were like, how they, dare you like imply defensive. that I wasn't crushing it in high school, you know, in secondary yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, I was getting smooches left yeah. and right, you know, or the French equivalent of a smooch. He was getting he was getting that left and right. And he was very upset that you would suggest that he had. I know. So we clearly know that, that American cartoonists are okay with calling themselves nerd and trying to make a career yeah. for themselves financially. French cartoonists not yes. okay with calling themselves a nerd <laughs> and not okay with talking about how to earn a, uh, how to earn a Euro. Anyway. Uh, so having said all that though, I think it would be so fun to take comic lab yes. to Angoulême and I don't know how we would do it. Uh, I'm sort of, oh. you know, in that, that, how that, do we get on their radar? Dave? I don't know. How do we get this on their is, radar? This is me sort of, you know, that bullshit philosophy of the secret that, you know, you put something out into the universe and then, and then the sparkles of the universe bring you a dollar or whatever it is with the secret. Oh, we're going to manifest. We're going to manifest. We're going to manifest. Uh, uh, no, but I, I do want to speak the intention though, that I, I somehow I want to figure out how to connive my way into getting invited. You and I with comic lab to uncle him. Cause I think it'd be so fun to go have some wine, do a talk, maybe do a little bit assigning to, to a French audience that does not give two shits about yeah. us. <laughs> I think that and, would be and, fun. And, 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 and have some wine. <laughs> and have... <laughs> <laughs> my my in-laws just got back from a trip to Spain and they were talking about how great the wine is because Span and yeah, my Spanish wife says, wine, yeah, yeah, well, of course, Spanish wine. And I said, yeah, and over there, it's domestic. <laughs> you know, you don't even have to consider it an import. It's domestic because they were saying it was pretty affordable to get nicely sloshed over there in Spain. <laughs> uh, and so I am 100% on board with this uh, trip to Merlot to uh, share, share, I'm sorry, to <laughs> <laughs> to share our comics. I, I look forward and, and, to and, our Chardonnay trip to Morlot. Yes. And I, <laughs> and I, and I, and I hope that we can Pina Grigi go very soon. Wow. I think it would wow, be a you fantastic that time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to do a French version of the show. Just like one French episode that we can send them. Uh, could you learn enough French? We could fake our way through no, it. No, I've told you the story about how I, whenever I go to France, I always, I love a ham and cheese <laughs> croissant and I always order a ham and cheese croissant in French. And because of the way I pronounce ham, it sounds like almond in French. And so I always end up with a freaking almond croissant, but my, my, the small school kid in me is too ashamed and I won't say, no, thank you. This is not what I wanted. And I hate almonds. So I sit there eating the almond croissant. Every Every time I go to France, that happens, Brad. Every time. <laughs> oh, well, you're but I would starve because all I remember from my high school French class was on va à la plage, which means one goes to the beach. <laughs> and so I, I I would I would be able to get a, a, a trip. I could get an Uber to the beach or, or an Uber to the beach. And that Uber. would be it. I would starve. <laughs> I, had a, I had a friend in college. We were we were um, uh, traveling around uh, Europe with a Europass and um 
he learned in like 14 different languages. He would say, excuse me, do you have a one one red towel that I could borrow, please? And he would say that to people in, he would say it in Magyar, in French, in Spanish, in German. And people would be like, what the hell is this weird American coming up and asking me for a red towel? <laughs> one he, red this towel. was his joke to himself. But anyway, so that's that's oh my, my goal. God. That's my new five-year goal for Comic Lab. I don't know how I'm going to do it. By God, I'm going to figure out how I'm going to get us invited to Angolem, and we're going to talk about comics and capitalism to people that want yes. to hear about neither from Americans. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. From people who are too busy getting smooches to worry about that's either right, one of those right, things, we're right. going to talk to them. So listen, Dave, let's go back to another question we've got from one of our $5 Patreon backers, and it goes like this. This is coming in from Jay, who says, hey, I've noticed that although I've been making meaningful and consistent updates since April and making sure to leave each update on sort of a cliffhanger, my comic has dropped in likes while raising in views per update. Is this anything to worry about? And does it require a reactive pivot? Or should I stay the course? Thanks for the fantastic content. So Jay wrote in earlier, and we were talking about writing and everything. Right. We gave him some advice, and he said, listen, I've been taking the advice ever since April. Uh, my views are going up. My likes are going down. Should I? Should this person be worried, Dave Kellett? Well, I, I, keeping in mind that uh, likes are the Internet's equivalent of monopoly money, uh, that in, in, yeah. in meaning that you can't do anything with them. I think you're OK and you're on broadly the right path. I mean, it's never a great sign that likes are going down. But frankly, I'm just guessing here that they went from six likes to five likes. And you're like, oh, no, the likes are going yeah. down, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, but if your if your views are going up and, and you have a sense from a couple different metrics that more people are reading or they're reading deeper in the archive or or that uh, more people are interacting with the comic. I think broadly speaking, that's good. You're on the right path. You're fine. Yes. Um, and, and, and before I let Brad jump in, I will say, though, that I, I do worry a little bit about this idea that that every update is ending on a cliffhanger. And I know Brad yeah. will share this, too, because Brad was the first one many years ago to uh, elucidate for me that you want to have every comic end on something meaningful it's got to if it's not a punchline it's a meaningful moment for a comic if it's not a meaningful or a character if it's not a meaningful moment for the character the storyline has a twist if it's not a storyline it's a cliffhanger if it's not a cliffhanger it's a sad moment that truly is heartbreaking for that character something ha at the end it has to have a payoff to that installment such that it brings people back the idea being that it's the it's the desire to come back that's the primary motivator because it works yeah. even when that comic is brought to the book because then they have a desire yeah. to flip the page, right? So right. even even whether you're looking at it on a on a on an installment as a web comic or in a book format, Brad's idea of a meaningful conclusion to that page, that update is important, but I do worry, and I bet Brad worries more than I do too, that that it's always on a cliffhanger because I don't know that that's yeah. the right way to look at this. Yeah, uh, and you 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 uh, uh, hit the nail right on the head. I'm not. I I, I it, okay. Let's put it this way: if I if it had to be one thing to go down and the other one to go up, you've got exactly the right choice. In other words, I want the views to go up. I don't care as much about the likes. Right? If it was the opposite, the likes went up but the views went down, I'd be worried. Something isn't jiving there. Right? right? But. The view of the two, the views are much more important. You, I, I'd like to, uh, it, and those likes, it just might be uh, a, a case of every once in a while, not often, like every once in a while, uh, putting uh, an extra panel on the an, an update that isn't a panel so much as it's a little call to action, a small one mm -hmm. saying, hey, don't forget to like and subscribe, you know, that whole thing. We all hate it, but there's a reason they do it, and that's because it's generally effective. I wouldn't do it so often that it causes banner blindness, but every once in a month or so worth of updates, I'd throw in an extra panel that was a call to action. Okay. And again, small. You don't want that to be overbearing. Just... Just a little something gives them a nudge, puts a thought a in their head. A little moose-boosh of, of... That's oh, yeah. right. It, 
to, to prep to ourselves use a, for Angoulême, a, we got a little amuse That's right. Yeah. To use a French phrase from the French, whom we love. Whom, whom we love and are excited to speak to five years from now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, just a little amuse bouche uh, to, to give them a little nudge towards doing it, I think would be just the trick. Now, let's talk about that writing. Uh, it, it, because, like Dave already kind of gave us the preface, we've talked a lot on this show about frequent, consistent, and significant. Mm-hmm. That your best balance for publishing your comic is as frequently as you can Mm -hmm. while maintaining consistency in quality and in updates while maintaining that each one of those updates is significant. And on the show, probably the show where we talked to, to Jay the first time, we probably said that there's a lot of ways that you can make your comics significant. You can make that update significant. And we probably, of course, both of us, punchline was probably the first words out of our mouth. And we probably also said you could also do it with a cliffhanger and this and that. And and it, and it sounds to me like you zeroed in on cliffhanger and you decided that was going to be your solution for every update. It was going to be a cliffhanger, right? right? right. <laughs> but here's the thing. Let's talk a little bit more in depth about that because there are so many ways to make a comic update significant. Yes, you can end on a punchline. That's always, that's, but let's say you're not doing a funny story. That's not going to be so great, right? right? So you can also do a cliffhanger. You can also resolve a conflict. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's, that's very satisfying to, to, and, and I want you to remember that because I'm going to circle back to conflict resolution. You can also have a surprise, right? A surprise is a great way to uh, end uh, an update. And also a revelation. If you reveal something that you've been hiding uh, throughout the storyline, revelations are good. And, and by the way, I just listed five right off the top of my head. There's more. I, but listen, because, there are hundreds depending on what kind of story. Yes. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. There, there's a, an, a nigh infinite ways to make that meaningful, that significant ending to you. The characters, the story, the plot line, the look of the comic. It could be something as simple as right. an explosion where the visuals are the are the break. You know, it, uh, yeah. it doesn't, it, what I'm getting at is, depending on the style of story you're telling, there's a, there's a bajillion ways to make that significant and meaningful. Yeah. So, so, and, and, and by the way, remember what we said in the past about the human brain is a, is, is, is trained to look for patterns. Mm-hmm. If you have storytelling where every single one of your updates ends in a cliffhanger, your readers, the ones that are sticking with you for now are going to notice that pattern and they're going to dislike it (laughs) because they know it's coming. It's like, it's like, okay, Dave, let's say you're at a wedding and, and you're, you're, it's your wedding. (laughs) This is getting better and better all the time. (laughs) And you've hired a band. Okay. And the band, you're out there dancing with Gloria and you're dancing to a nice waltz. And the band comes to the end of the waltz. And at the end of the waltz, they go. (laughs) You think to yourself, well, that was an odd musical choice, choice. but that, but that is, but that is the way a lot of songs end. So, okay, that's all right. But, but now this band is playing a rock number and you're out there dancing, uh, dancing up a storm and they're, they got the guitars out. They come to the end. And you think, now what the hell was that? I, you just, it's a different song, but you played the same ending. That's, that's awfully weird, but you've got no time to think about that because now they're playing a cha-cha. Yump, bump. Bump, ba-da-dum, ba-da-bum, bum bum And you're, what, what, what just happened here, right? <laughs> they played three different songs, but it was the same ending. And now that you've noticed the pattern, you can't appreciate the rumba that's coming up next because you are just going to be waiting for that ending. Right, it's like they took the crappiest part of Salieri's advice to Mozart, which is where you got to tell the audience where to clap, you know? And they're like, well, we got to let them know the song is over. ba da bum ba da bum flap. It's like, well, that was a weird ending. To, to a guitar solo that's an odd <laughs> yeah but but it's okay because now they're playing classical music so imagine Beethoven in all his sulliness like ending it yeah. 
<laughs> He's doing the little jazz hands at the end. <laughs> and you're and you're the one guy in the orchestra that gets to hit the cymbal on that last note. You've been waiting the entire passage for this, your one big moment. Uh, so yeah, that's why you can't ever every update on a cliffhanger. Right. You've gotta you've got to, you've gotta think as a writer would think and and plan for this. And and it, if you want it, if you want to know the truth, if you want to know the truth. In my mind, I'm going to share you my own personal writing philosophy. Maybe it touches off an idea for you. But when I'm planning a comic update, mm-hmm. and my comic updates twice a week, at, at, and that becomes one page in the eventual graphic novel, just to give you an idea how this is going. The perfect comic update mm-hmm. for me is this. There is an idea or a concept that's introduced in the first panel. In the next re- uh, panels after that, there's a conflict that is built off of that idea, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Something happens, it's introduced, then you introduce a conflict. There's tension, right? Uh, Whatever that is, conflict is the next ingredient. And then in the final panel, somehow that conflict is resolved. And that's, for me, that's a story beat. There's there's something introduced, conflict and resolution. Right, right. That process, for me, I can make that into a significant mo- uh, moment if I have those three general ingredients, an idea, a conflict, and a resolution. And if that resolution is meaningful, mm-hmm. that's, that's a significant update. I don't need a cliffhanger. I just, resol- I just resolved a conflict. And that's going to be uh, what I can hang my hat on. Now, I, I, I can do that and I can add a punchline even better. Hey, the punchline that uh, resolves that conflict, ah, oh, chef's kiss yeah. if you're working in humor. But there's all kinds of ways that you, uh, as a writer, can resolve that conflict. But I think instead of relying on the, the cliffhanger, and by the way, it's a bit of a... Uh, it's a bit of a dodge there, right? The cliffhanger, it's not, you're not resolving anything. And if it's happening over and over and over again, you're wearing your audience out. Uh, it's not, yes. and and uh, for those of you with a little gray in your hair, they're saying newspaper comics did it all the time. Yes, you're right. Newspaper comics also had a trapped audience that had to come back to them day after day. They didn't have a choice. So Think about conflict resolution when you're ending that update. I think that's going to be the answer for you. Absolutely. And I, I would like to just admit to my own failing in this regard, and uh, and perhaps Brad has a version of this as well, which is I'm t- with Drive, I'm telling a long-form sci-fi humor opera. Like the story goes on. It's, it's going to take me 10, 15 years to finish it. Uh, that takes care of itself. It's sci-fi. That takes care of itself. But I tend to lean towards comedy to make my significant, meaningful ending a punchline, right? But here's the problem with that, is that I am telling a long form story that has serious underpinnings. So I have to allow sometimes for significant, meaningful conclusions to a page, to a story, to an update that are either sad or tragic or heartbreaking. And what I'm getting at there is you're you're erring towards uh, cliffhangers. I err towards humor too much. And sometimes I have to tell myself it is okay for the character to be sad right now. This is a sad moment. Allow this (laughs) to happen. Not everything has to have a treacle cutter where they need a laugh at the end. Like, let them be sad. Let the story be heartbreaking at this moment. Let this be a a rendering moment for for that character. And so I'm just speaking for me personally, Brad. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have to tell myself it's okay to not be funny in a humor story all the time. Sometimes the significant, meaningful thing is to let the character have a revelatory moment of sadness or of, 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 of a heartbreak, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, absolutely. And I've had the same, I've been in the same spot where I, I find myself Tra- you know, trying to wedge the punchline in there. And it's like, oh, you're ruining this moment with a punchline. You're, you're yep. totally, you're, you're screwing it up. You know, uh, in fact, I've, I've done certain things where, uh, I've, I've changed the order of events. So every now and again, like I'll get a light punchline in early and then, resolve it uh, to something that's non-funny <laughs> I, I at the end. A light punch line. Something made me laugh about that. Like it was a chef. Yeah. I put a, I, in the early yeah. course, I put a light punch line so that later on I could really hit the, uh, no, but this is all, all of this to say is that when we don't feel like we're attacking you about saying the word cliffhanger, because we're not, we're just saying right, right, like right. even Brad and I 
have we all have our crutches that we lean on. And for me, yes. it's trying to end everything with treacle or with or with humor. Um, and for a French cartoonist, it's trying to end it with ennui or a disdain for capitalism. And so we all have our <laughs> we all have our crutch that we lean on. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, Brad, let's jump over to our next question over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And this comes in from Richard, who writes, Hi, Brad and Dave. What recommendations do you have about delivering bad news to your readers? For example, how do you let your Kickstarter backers know that a book will be delayed? What about when the bad news is about something you're actively choosing to do? Reducing your update schedule or putting your archive behind a paywall? It's good for you, but it's bad for your readers. How do you deliver that type of news in a way that won't have them reaching for their pitchforks? Thanks, as always, for the yeah. advice. The show is an absolute joy to listen to. Well, thank you, Richard. And Brad, what advice do you have for Richard in terms of delivering bad news? Okay, well, I will. I would argue that only one of the things that he just talked about was bad news, and that the sooner he understands that, the more he'll be able to communicate clearly with his readers. Right. There was only one thing there that was bad news, and that was a Kickstarter that was going to be delayed. Uh, reducing your, your update schedule is not necessarily bad news. It's neutral news. And if it means that you can do better work, it's good news. And the archives as well, that's good news. <laughs> and, and, and to approach it as bad news that, oh, this, I'm going to put things behind the paywall, but, but of course you're going to hate that. And, and so that's bad news. If, if you approach your readers that way, they're going to reach for the pitchfork. Again, what we, we talked about this last episode, uh, when you see your two-year-old run into a wall. You don't say, oh, my God, you poor little sweet thing. You ran into a wall. No, you you deal with it very calmly. You wait and see, and then you react. You uh, So only one of those things was bad news, I, I'm going to argue. But how do you, let's go, take the question. How do you handle bad news as directly and as clearly and as shortly, if that's a word, as it you can? <laughs> Uh, briefly, yeah, briefly, briefly, there we go. Yeah. So here's the deal. You want to communicate clearly what's going on yep. and give a quick explanation why that is. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Here's here's the thing. We are uh, the, the Kickstarter is, is going to be delayed. The reason for this is that uh, COVID has caused a paper sh shortage and my printer is not going to be able to do the book. I will keep you posted with new information as soon as I have it. I apologize for this delay, and I will be doing my best to get those books into your hands as quickly as I can because I cannot wait for you to read this mm -hmm, book. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, boom. End on a positive note. I can't wait to get these into your hands and out. No more. No, no, no wailing, no gnashing of teeth. Yep. Done. Do you agree? I do. And I say this is a guy who in my personal life, as I go through my yeah. physical day, I often feel like I have to apologize for existing. Do you ever have this, Brad? Where you're, like, yes. you're at a yes. supermarket and you're, you didn't even do anything wrong and you're apologizing oh. for I. It's just my nature of, as a person. I apologize for all sorts of things. I'm very Canadian that way. Like, oh, I'm sorry that I yes. you know, jostled you ever so slightly. Um, but anyway, yes. uh, so what uh, what I would say, though, is that Brad's advice is right on here you don't have to apologize for apologizing because a lot of these aren't really apologies. It's just a statement yeah. of fact. Like um, you, you state it as clearly as possible. Um, you, you get out quick and clean. You don't have to give all sorts of thumperings about, Hey, well, I'm so sorry. And the reason I'm so yeah. sorry is I just want to do the best for you. And I mean, you state the facts, you get out cleanly. And then I, frankly, I would add you, you don't allow for the opportunity for complaint in terms of like you mm -hmm. end on a positive note, bada bing, bada boom. These are the facts. These are the ways that they're, that are going. You can't change the fact by complaining. So please don't kind of, you know, like you don't give an opportunity for saying like, no. Hey, and if you have any problem, give me feedback or you can email yeah. me like, no, Oh, don't do that. That's yeah. fine. Because here, if you're upset about this, if you're upset about this, get in touch and let me know. No, yeah. no, no. You don't, you don't want to plant that seed. Right. You want right. to, you want to address it, it. Yes. explain it and end on a positive note. Yeah. And end on a positive note. Cause remember that for the bulk of your readership, you are still giving them a free comic. 
So the complaint yeah. has no ground to stand on for the most part. And for patrons, well, that or Kickstarter backers, that's a different area. You'll address that appropriately. But remember, for Kickstarter yeah. backers, the the final and big message is this book is absolutely still coming to you. It maybe it's a yes. little bit delayed. Don't worry about that. That's because we're doing everything we can to make it perfect. You're gonna love the book, and we'll see you soon with better news or with good news. You know that kind of thing. Yeah. And and so again, it's 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 a return to the positive. It's gratefulness, and it's it's getting out cleanly without apologizing for apologizing. Yeah. And, and, and the other one, what was the other one that, that he mentioned? He says, uh, putting a, a reduced update schedule. That's, that's not bad news. That's news. Hey, I'm going to scale back to two, uh, two updates a week instead of five. Right. The good news about that is I'm going to be able to deliver such better work. Yes. That I think you're really going to love what's happening next. Uh, that's not, again, it's actually the same pattern. It's kind of like state it, uh, explain it, and then end on a positive note. But it's not bad news. It's just news. Yeah. Hey, here's something you need to know about. The update schedule is going to change. Uh, good news about that is I'm going to be able to do so much better stuff. You're going to love it. Stay tuned. The next update is Friday. Right. And and again, to, to reinforce what Brad's brilliant advice just was, you end on a positive yeah. note by saying, I'm excited about this change because, like we said earlier with the social contract, I'm honoring what I need as an artist in order to keep creating. So you're, you're definitely going to keep getting this because this reduced schedule or behind the paywall makes it possible for me to keep going. And I'm so excited with the output that this is going to generate, with the way that I'm treating myself as an artist, with the way the story is going to be treated. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to yeah. be an improvement. So it's not even a lie because it is true. You're doing it to honor yourself as an artist, whether it's putting behind a paywall, reducing your schedule, doing this, doing that, doesn't matter. Yep. Usually those kind of choices, even though they're good for you, uh, the, uh, seem bad for the readership. But in fact, they are good for the readership because if I reduce my yeah. schedule on drive, it's usually to honor the fact that I need new parameters to create healthfully, you know. And so even though healthfully isn't a word, I like Brad with shortly, I'm going to use it because you know why? <laughs> da -da 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 -da. There, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, <it's all> good. <laughs> no, and, and, and listen, so much of this, again, it, it, it reveals our own insecurities yes, as and our artists, artists guilt. that we think some, yes, yes. And we think, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm going to do this thing. And now I've got bad news and people are going to be upset. But uh, a lot of it is, is you do have a, uh, you have the first chance at, framing how that uh, gets put across. And then if somebody does get upset uh, and has a complaint, you can deal with it. But listen, uh, that's, that's, that's going to happen every now and again, as a creator, the only way that you go through life without somebody getting upset is you, you just don't do anything. And, and then those are the only people that nobody ever gets upset about the people that do nothing. Right. As for Dave and I, we, we do something. We we've done another episode of comic lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Hey, hey, hey he did it. He landed the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Your hosts have been my wonderful friend, Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of evil Inc. at evil hyphen comic.com. And my good friend Dave Kellett, the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at TheWorldRecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode like this one. This one comes into me. Listen to this, Dave. It says, I just want to say thank you so much for the podcast Comic Lab with your partner, Dave, who, by the way, sounds like the Joaquin Phoenix Joker every time he laughs. You got that's you, evidently, Dave. I gotta go watch that again. That's terrifying. Yeah, no All right. How wonderful for my wife. Good boy. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. I've been listening to your podcast for about a week now. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> After that first week, we get a lot less hilarious. But in that yeah. first honeymoon week, that first week, week is Dave, our golden hour. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You guys are hilarious. I've been listening to your podcast for about a week now while I'm at work. You guys inspired me to do comics again, and it opened my mind about what it takes to make comics. I've been doing freelance for a while now, maybe 12 years as a side gig trying to live my dream. I've been doing comic cons and selling art, but not really pushing myself to do paneling or anything else. Selling prints and commissions really took me away from what I want to be. One of your episodes really opened my mind that you don't need to work in a big company to establish yourself as a comic book artist. I can create my own and do my own project. 
I have my own project that I'm working on with my fellow artist friends. It's been seven years and I haven't finished because I was busy with doing commissions and prints at Comic Cons. But I'm serious this time to keep this project moving. And again, Comic Lab really helped me get motivated. Thank you so much. Keep doing what you do and more power to your podcast. That is fantastic. What kind words. I appreciate that, especially coming in after just a week. That's fantastic. That's right. He'll feel differently in another month. (laughs) That's right. And we also want to thank this week's sponsor of the show, Le Festival International de la Bande Dissonée de Angoulême. We are so thankful to them. (laughs) sponsoring the show <laughs> and by sponsoring I mean by inviting us somewhere in the next five years to Uncle M uh, yes. the Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab so we'll go ahead and say that twice because things that you don't support disappear patreon.com slash comic lab So, Brad, I remember the panel talk where I literally said I was addressing a whole room of cartoonists. And I said, and yes. well, listen, the reason why we became artists, let's be honest here. None of us were, were smooching a lot in high school. <laughs> and I thought that was a, a truth universal that, that it was like, yes. listen, you're not drawing a lot if you're smooching. You're actively going to be choosing smooching if you're if you're if you yeah. can, uh, you know, if you can. And. Brad, it hit them in their core. They were not, the French artists were not willing to admit that truth that they might not have been crushing it left and right in secondary school. In fact, I think they only paused smooching long enough to come out on the panel. And then as soon as that panel was done, right back to smooching. That was just, they, they had taken a, a, a 30 minute break. In fact, his lips still looked a little tired, if I'm being honest. And I wasn't looking that close at his lips. But if I were, I would say that they looked like they were a little bit fatigued. If anything, we should have been grateful that he gave up the time to come talk on the panel because there was so much smooching yes. to be had. Just just took a, a, a long enough break from whatever was going on backstage to come out, say a few words and go right back to smooching. Put down the, the cigarette, put down the smooching partner came up to share some wisdom on the panel right back to the cigarette and smooching. (laughs) 